program in focus, and today we focus on Hillary Rodham, Arkansas's new first lady and the wife of Governor Bill Clinton. She's a native of Illinois and was raised in the Chicago area. She has an undergraduate degree from Wellesley University and a law degree from Yale University, and that's where she met her husband. Ms. Rodham is a former law professor at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville and is a practicing attorney in Little Rock. We'll have a chance to get better acquainted with Arkansas's new First Lady on this edition of In Focus, and we'll be back with the initial question in just a moment. The Food and Drug is... The First Lady for Arkansas now for about a month. Do you mm -hmm. feel comfortable in this new position, if it can be called a position? Well, I think it is a position, Jack, and I do feel comfortable, but there is still a lot to learn and a lot to be done that uh, we're just becoming acquainted with, so it's a little early to talk very much about adjustment from mm. person to person? Well, I suppose there are two things. One, of course, is the um, uh, lack of privacy, the fact that uh, Bill has to be uh, you know, followed by and around a lot of people all the time, and that, of course, we live in a public house in uh, the state, a beautiful house. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, with the legislature coming into session so soon, uh, after the governor's inaugurated, actually beginning the day before the governor's inaugurated, there's just so much work to be done and so many people to uh, fit into meetings and other kinds of arrangements that it's been a, a pretty much of a crash program the last couple of weeks to try to uh, keep up with all of the obligations that we both have. It took me a while to get here, I'll tell you. It was, it was hard to plan it and schedule it with everything else going on. The lack of privacy. Is that a problem? Does that bother you? You are in a fishbowl existence, and, mm -hmm. and I know that, that you have had some um, problems maybe in that regard already. Uh, how, do you, how do you handle that? Well, I think that anyone who's going to be in public life has to, first of all, uh, accept the fact that a certain amount of your privacy has to be curtailed because you have an obligation to be available to people and for uh, people to feel that they have access to you. That takes a certain amount of, of effort and, and work on your part. Um, it does concern me somewhat, though, because I think that with mass communications and ready accessibility by the media as well as transportation, people do feel, and justifiably so, very close to um, their elected officials and their public servants. The problem is that uh, it doesn't often provide enough time for us to lead private lives, you know, to be with one another, to have a family life, to have time to think. I mean, there's so many difficult decisions that Bill faces every day that if all he were were accessible to people, he could never have enough time to learn enough or to think enough to make the decisions. So I think it's a trade-off that one knows one makes when you enter public life, but I try as much as I can, particularly on his behalf, to uh, take as much effort as I can make to guard his privacy so that he has enough time to sleep and eat and think because I, I believe that the people elected him to make decisions and if he's just always a public person there's no time for that so it is a problem but it's one that uh, you know we're willing to live with and to figure out. He's gone so much of the time. You're gone part of the time as a practicing attorney. When are you all ever together? Well we're together as often as we can be and uh, of course, when he was Attorney General, we had the same sorts of problems um, in terms of finding enough time to be together. Uh, there's not enough time. We really enjoy being with one another, and we just have to make a special effort. I think that we try to keep the weekends as much as possible to ourselves and to our family and to close friends, um, and we try not to schedule things if we can at all avoid uh, doing so. We talk a lot on the telephone during the day and if he's gone we always talk uh, so we don't have as much time as I would like in an ideal world but probably we come down to having nearly as much time as most married couples do because uh, we really make the effort to do that there are those in the audience who would say but aha Ms. Rodham if you just wouldn't be a practicing attorney then you see that would eliminate some of the problems of not being together 
Well, no, because that wouldn't, unless I were going to take on the position of his bodyguard and follow him around all the time. I'm afraid that wouldn't solve it at all. In fact, I think that uh, uh, people who are married to politicians uh, are under a tremendous strain because unless you have a pretty strong sense of your own self-identity, it becomes very easy to be buffeted about by all the people that are around your husband. Uh, people who are advising him, people who want favors from him, people who want to do things with him or for him or to him. Uh, and very often those people are not anxious to have uh, the politician's wife or family members around because that's then competition for their time. Now that's not true in our case. We've got a very wonderful group of people that we're working with, but it has been true historically and particularly uh, has been more and more evident in the lives of our first families as they talk about the kinds of strains they've been under. But I think if one looks at the lives of most political people and looks at the, uh, the wives that are married to those politicians, one would find if they're not working, they're equally involved in other activities that take up their time because your husband is gone so much. Uh, he leaves at 7 o'clock in the morning for a meeting and goes on to receptions and appointments and business and all the rest of it and may have some kind of an event in the in the evening as well so that uh, now I think practicing law is something that in addition to a, a profession that I enjoy it's something that uh, kind of keeps me busy during all the time that uh, he would be gone anyway. One gets the impression that <clears throat> excuse me you're really not <clears throat> all that interested possibly in state dinners and teas and garden parties, the kinds of things that we attend to associate with governor's wives? Well, that's not a true impression. I'm interested in everything. I'm interested in uh, social events and civic events as well as uh, my own professional life. I don't see any reason to be a sort of either-or person. I never have. I think that you know, there's so many opportunities in life to learn new things and meet new people and uh, become involved in activities that it's uh, sort of short-sighted to cut oneself off from anything. So although I don't spend my time completely doing social events, I also don't spend it completely doing uh, sort of non-social uh, public interest or professional events either. I like to have a good mixture. I think that's fun. You get to meet more people who have different uh, viewpoints and perspectives on what's going on in the state, and I really enjoy it. But being a politician's wife, and we're told, and everyone seems to believe that your husband is a rising star on the political scene, uh, being a politician's wife, uh, it, it, as we've been chatting here, uh, puts such a strain on a marriage. It does. And I'm very um, uh, lucky because I married Bill when uh, he was a defeated politician. He had lost his race for Congress. And I had known him for a period of time before that in law school, before I ever knew really that he was interested in politics and had an opportunity to get to know him. And we have, uh, for me, an, an excellent marriage. I'm not sure that it would suit other people because the, the kinds of uh, strains that we've been talking about, being in the public eye, being separated from one another, are ones that uh, not everyone could live with. But I really believe in what he's doing. I think that he's a, you know, an, just a superb human being as well as a good politician. So that. Uh, for me, those are sacrifices that I'm willing to make, and he's very supportive of me and in, in everything that I do, and I try to, to do as much as I can for him so that I think there are strains in any marriage, and a political marriage, of course, has strains, but I'm not so sure that any marriage doesn't have their own particular kinds of strains, and each couple has to work out an accommodation uh, for whatever reasons there may be, so that we've worked out ours, and we're very happy, and uh, I just hope other people can work out their strains as well as I think we have. Any second thoughts though sometimes? No, never. What am never. I getting into? Never, never. I, um, uh, I was 28 or 29, I can't remember right now, but I was older when I got married. I knew exactly what might occur in my life, but uh, despite the trepidation that I felt at uh, the prospect of being married to a politician, it just, there wasn't any question. I mean, once you fall in love with somebody, you just if you want to sit around and analyze it, you can, but that seems to me to be kind of a, a fruitless way to respond. I should think you must get very tired, though, of being asked questions by people like me, newsmen like me, and by people in the general public about your decision not to use your husband's name. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't get tired of it. I think it's, it's an understandable question. Um, but for many of the uh, things that 
we've just been talking about, uh, the decision that to keep my own name, particularly in my professional work, was one that uh, seemed a very natural uh, kind of, of uh, decision because, as I said, I was older when I got married, and I had practiced law, and I had worked in Washington and Boston. I had written several articles, had developed something of a specialization in the area of children and family law, and I knew that we were going to be undergoing a great deal of scrutiny and a great deal of attention if Bill continued in politics, which he intended to do in some form or another. And since I wanted to continue practicing law, I really did not want to mix my professional activities with his political activities. I didn't want anyone ever to, to think that I was either taking advantage of, of his position or in some way riding on it. And there aren't very many ways to persuade people of that. But I thought it essential that I try to keep as much of a distinction between my legal career and my obligations as Bill's wife as I possibly could. Keeping my name was part of that, as well as the um, uh, sort of professional reputation that I'd already built up. Well, your husband won the governorship in a landslide, but we're still led to believe that it possibly could have cost him a few votes because your name is not the same, of his, uh, the same as his. I'm sure that it probably did, and I regret that very much. Um, I regret any reason for someone voting against a bill other than on the basis of a, an honest disagreement with the issues. Uh, people voted against him because of his youth, I think. Some people may have voted against him because he was born in Hope instead of Jonesboro. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why a voter might vote against a politician. Uh, they aren't good reasons in my mind. I think that. Uh, uh, as people get to know him better and as they watch him perform as governor, I think they will uh, realize, those that voted for him, that their confidence was well placed, and those that did not, that perhaps they should take a second look. Does it bother you that because you don't use your husband's name that people think you're too liberal? And after all, this is not a state known for liberalism. Well, I don't know about that. Anita Bryant didn't take her husband's name either, and I don't think that she has a liberal image. I think a lot of people have... Uh, images that are in no way related to reality. Um, and there's really not much that one can do about that. Uh, someone could uh, come up with an image of either me or my husband or you that if you were to sit down and talk with the person would dissolve because you'd realize that your image was not uh, in any way reflective of how that person acted or believed. And I can only hope that whatever image people might have of either me or Bill, uh, they will hold in abeyance until they have an opportunity to meet us or to talk with us. Uh, both of us are trying to get around the state and meet with people and visit with them and uh, uh, find out what's on their minds and share our you know, concerns as well as our hopes about what we're going to do in the next couple of years. Uh, so I'm sure that some people have an image. Some people may think I'm too conservative. Some people may think I'm you know, too this or too that. But uh, I think that's another one of the dangers about being in public life. Uh, one cannot live one's life based on what somebody else's image of you might be. I suppose that there have been many wives of politicians who uh, may have had serious problems uh, personally because they were worried about the image that they had and as to whether or not that would hurt their husband. All one can do is live the life that God gave you and, and you know, you just do the best you can and if somebody likes you or doesn't like you, that's uh, really in many ways something you have no control over. So. We have made a big deal, we in the news media have made a big deal over your husband's age, the fact that he is the youngest governor in the nation right now. He is the second youngest governor in the state's history just by a matter of months. The thought has occurred to me, though, that you may very well be the youngest first lady in the nation. I don't know. I, I don't uh, know whether that's true or not. I kind of doubt it since it's much more uh, likely that a, uh, a person in public life, a governor, would be married to a, a woman who was, you know, younger than he was. So I don't know. No one has said that to me. Uh, uh, so I really have no way of knowing whether it's true or not. Your youth, his youth, your youth, is that a problem for you as you try to get settled now in the, in the governor's mansion as you deal with the veteran politicians of the state? It hasn't proven to be. Um, at least uh, thus far, in many ways, it's been a blessing because the amount of work that's required is uh, demanding on one's stamina and enthusiasm. Uh, both of which uh, Bill and I are lucky to have. Um, so no, we have not run into those difficulties. I'm sure, again, that there are some people who 
are concerned about our youth. Um, but I think that will also begin to dissolve, depending upon the kind of job that we do. The thought occurs to me that you really don't fit the image that we have created <clears throat> for the governor's wife in Arkansas. You're not a native. Um, you've been educated in liberal eastern universities. You're less than 40. You don't have any children. You don't use your husband's name. You practice law. Does it concern you that maybe other people feel that you don't fit the image that we have created for the governor's wife in Arkansas? No, because just as I said before, I think that um, each person should be uh, assessed and judged on uh, you know that person's own merits. And uh, I'm not 40, but that hopefully will be cured by age. Eventually I will be. Uh, we don't have any children yet. And we're hoping to have children, so that I hope will be cured in a uh, number of years also. Um, that doesn't bother me. Um, and I hope that it doesn't bother uh, very many people. I think that, uh, in a way, it's uh, kind of a tribute to the state uh, that uh, someone who may or may not fit an image is accepted on, on her own terms. You know, I came, up, came to Arkansas of my own free will. You know, I was not born here, and I fell in love with the state and decided to stay, and, and Bill and I were married. Uh, I think that is a kind of indication of what we're trying to do in the state, that the time of feeling that Arkansas was in any way uh, second to anybody, or the thank God for Mississippi image that we've, I think, had for too long, is beginning to disappear. And I want to do everything that I can uh, to help that go as fast as we can make it disappear. Because, you know, I have friends all over the country, people who are constantly asking me, you know, what it's like living in Arkansas, you know, why I moved here, and, and all the rest of it. And you know, I'm someone who has lived in other places. You know, I, I lived outside of large cities. I've lived on the East Coast. I've been all over the country and in some parts of Europe. And I just cannot think of a better place to be living right now. And you know, that may sound kind of uh, trite, but uh, you know, I, I just think that we've got so many opportunities, and that at the same time we've got a chance to meld what has always been, to me at least, one of the great parts of, of Arkansas heritage, which is our sort of uh, individualistic tradition and the ties that uh, bind people with all of the possibilities for economic and other kinds of growth. So I don't know about image. I just hope that the reality is going to match what I want the image of the state to be. And if I can participate and contribute to that, I'll just be very happy about it. What else has attracted you to Arkansas? Well, I think the energy that people are beginning to display. You know, I. Um, taught at the law school up in Fayetteville for two years and uh, was able to spend time with uh, you know students you know people in the in the law school and the college and was able really to observe just a, a continuing growth and and uh, hope in the future that there was a, a chance of translating you know our slogan land of opportunity into reality and I like that kind of energy people aren't sort of beaten down by what's gone on before they feel like uh, you know, the future's before them rather than behind them. You know, one, when one visits some of the larger cities uh, that I'm familiar with now, there's such a feeling of, of oh, just lack of possibilities, that uh, time has kind of passed them by and that they're kind of withering on the vine. Well, there isn't that here. Uh, and there may be a, a certain amount of optimism that uh, uh, one in uh, some other situation might say is, is unfounded or a little naive, but I like that too. I think you cannot achieve things unless you have a certain set of ideals and goals and, and are willing to dream about possibilities. And I think that's what's happening in this state. I find it really exciting. Um, you know, I can't say enough about it. I hope everybody, if there is anybody out there listening and watching or caring what we're talking about, feels the same way and that uh, each of us is going to try to do everything we can to encourage the other person. The only thing that has ever bothered me about Arkansas since I've lived here is uh, the remnant of, of feeling that uh, I saw in some of my students that, you know, that, that we weren't as able to seize opportunities. Maybe we weren't as good as, as people elsewhere. Uh, and I, I think that's beginning to disappear. And as fast as we can make it disappear, I think we're going to uh, continue to just grow and, and do all sorts of good things. The slower pace didn't bother you here. The poverty that we have here that didn't bother you when you came here. Oh, I've you know I've seen you know, poverty all over the world, and I know that you know when I was growing up outside of Chicago, one of the uh, 
the ways that we spent a lot of our times in our church youth groups was going out and, and working with people who were uh, very poor, you know, migrants and people living in the slums of Chicago and other places. So I'm always, I've always been familiar with poverty um, and have always done what I could to, in any way that I can to alleviate it and to, to help people. Um, of course it bothers me, but it's everywhere. It's not an Arkansas problem. It's a universal problem. Uh, I think maybe because we aren't as large as some other places, we can have a, a more personal understanding of what other people are living through who may not be in our family or down our block, but are in our communities because our communities are still, by and large, smaller. Uh, I hope that's true. Uh, the slower pace uh, was a welcome relief. You know, when I moved to Washington, I had uh, moved from Washington to Arkansas. I had just finished working on the impeachment inquiry staff, and we had worked you know, 18, 20 hours a day, sometimes overnight, um, because the pressure was so intense and the, the kind of work that we were doing was so important to us all. I, I was pleased to live in a community where people were willing to lead a more full and rounded life. People weren't just workaholics. They were uh, involved in community activities. They took family and friends seriously, and uh, I was very glad to be there. But so often, people who come from the outside of Arkansas say, we're so unprogressive here. We're just not as progressive as they are up north or somewhere else. Well, I think that depends upon what they mean and what we mean by progressive. Um, you know, if it's progress to default on your bond obligations so that your city's going into bankruptcy, or if it's progress to have a, such an incredible crime rate that people don't venture outside their doors, or if it's progress to live in a city whose air you can't breathe, well, then I hope we are unprogressive, and I hope we never get to the point where that's our definition of progress. Um, I think people who say that about us or to us um, just don't have any understanding of what's happening in Arkansas and what has happened for the last uh, several years. I think we're making progress as we define progress. We are trying to industrialize and increase our economic development at the same time that we take care of our environment. Uh, you know, I was uh, driving over here today with a gentleman and we were talking about uh, his living out in the country. You know, he doesn't want to move to Little Rock. He doesn't even want to live in Jonesboro. He wants to stay in the community where he is of about 500 people. He just wants to be able to have an opportunity there for his children to go to good schools and for uh, the people in the community to have good paying jobs. And if we can spread our economic development across the state so that people can stay where they are, we can avoid a lot of the problems that have happened in other cities. I mean, if you take a city like Atlanta even, which is uh, growing so rapidly, well, it's depleting the other parts of the state. People are moving into Atlanta, and they're not staying where they were because there are no jobs there. Uh, well, our definition, and Bill's talked about this all through the, the campaign and in his first weeks as governor, our definition of progress is having a well-balanced uh, kind of growth that reaches all sectors of the economy, all regions of our state, and all kinds of people, so that we're not just focusing the growth in one particular part of the state, and that we have industry that comes here that is compatible with our environment, so that we don't, in 10 or 15 years, turn around and are sorry that we've progressed because we now no longer can breathe, or we can't hunt, or we can't walk in a quiet place. You know, that's our idea of progress, keeping the quality of life that enables people to live with some sense of um, harmony between themselves and you know their neighbors and nature and all, and at the same time being able to lead good lives that uh, are remunerative and that enable them to raise their children, and I, you know that's what we mean by progress. I don't know what somebody else means by progress when they say we aren't progressive, you know. Ms. Rodden, you said in the past that Arkansas is the kind of state where one person can make a difference and that's one thing you appreciated about this state. In your own case, could that mean a difference on the Equal Rights Amendment, for example? Oh, I don't know. Um, I think that the um, Equal Rights Amendment is uh, in for some very hard sledding in the General Assembly. Uh, I have always supported the Equal Rights Amendment. I think that much of the uh, opposition to it is based on misinformation. And I know that many people sincerely believe uh, that the Equal Rights Amendment would cause all kinds of, uh, of difficulties. I just don't share that belief based on my own study of constitutional history and my understanding of it. Uh, I doubt if it could make a difference uh, in that particular area, but I will certainly 
be willing to do whatever I can to talk with people and to visit with them about, you know, my impression of it. I know that uh, uh, Rosalind Carter said the other day that she just found it bewildering to perceive all of the opposition to it, and I, to some extent, share that belief. I, I think that the opposition is much more uh, out of a sense of frustration, really, at the way that uh, uh, our country has developed in the last uh, several years, that indeed we seem to have lost sight of all kinds of uh, purposes and goals that uh, we once held, or at least thought we held. Uh, but I don't think that uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, frankly, would uh, stem the flow of, uh, of that kind of activity that uh, we all agree is destructive to family and community and all the rest. I think that we need to take action against that in some other areas. Uh, one of the areas that I've been particularly interested in is uh, the area of children. And I think that uh, much of the energy that, for instance, is focused opposing the Equal Rights Amendment, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, would be better spent doing uh, activities on behalf of abused children or trying to find some uh, decent facilities to help care for the children of those women who have to work. Um, many times I think that uh, people forget what it is like to raise a child alone because of uh, being widowed or divorced. Uh, and we have so many women like that in Arkansas. And despite the claims of um, the opponents of the Equal Rights Amendment, the wage differential between men and women continues to grow larger in our state. Uh, and there are just a lot of problems that I think we need to, to face head on. And I'd like to see some... ...for children, particularly for the care of uh, neonatal and perinatal problems. Uh, in many parts of our state, we don't even have an obstetrician in the county so that, you know, women who are pregnant have to go to another part of the state or across the state border to be taken care of. Well, we should be able to provide the facilities here for our children. Uh, and Bill has introduced uh, uh, legislation this session that would set up a perinatal health care network in the state. Uh, focused on the Arkansas Children's Hospital in Little Rock as the sort of best hospital so that we would refer uh, children from, you know, Truman or Jonesboro into the uh, facilities on a regional level and then if they had serious problems into Little Rock rather than having to go to Memphis. Uh, I'd really like to, to see the time when we could take care of all of our children's health care problems here. And on that note, we must end. Our thanks to Hillary Rodham the wife of Governor Bill Clinton, for being our guest today on this edition of In Focus. In Focus is a weekly public affairs presentation of Channel 8 television. Each week at this time... A